you are free from sin because of the blood. What can wash away my sin? What? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm free because of the blood. And we thank God for his grace and mercy this morning because of the blood. Amen. Come on, celebrate him in this place. Celebrate him in this place. We thank God for the blood of Christ that cleanses and washes us, makes us whole. There is a word from the Lord in Matthew chapter 26, just two verses. In Matthew 26, 31 and 32. Reading from the New International Version, you will find these words. Then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And a prophetic announcement and admonishment to God's people. Cold black, shepherd down. Tell your neighbor what we're talking about. Tell somebody, cold black, shepherd down. Um, thank you, ushers. There is a widespread myth about a famous short speech supposedly delivered by Winston Churchill. It, it, most versions of it go something like this. Famous story about Winston Churchill near the end of his distinguished career was asked to return and speak at his old school, the Harrow School, where as a boy he'd almost flunked out. The great day finally arrived, and after the school's fanfare and acclamation, Sir Winston stood to his feet, acknowledged the introduction, and gave the following address, which is quoted in full. Young men, never give up. Never give up. Never give up. Never, 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 never. At which it is reported that he sat down. According to Bartlett's familiar quotations, the speech was not delivered near the end of Churchill's career. He died in 1965. The speech was given on October 29, 1941. He wasn't Sir Winston Churchill until 1953. And what he really said was, never give in, never give in, never, never, never in nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except to conviction of honor and good sense. The familiar speech was not 29 words. It was two pages long. But we like the quote of it because it was during the height of World War II. And this short speech, which we characterize inaccurately in history, we do remember for its inspirational notation. A leader delivered a message in the time of war, encouraging young boys at a school that he had flunked out of, but had now found success in his journey to never give up. We immortalize his words because they inspire us. Uh, 17, 16 months ago, I was blessed to sit about 150 feet from President Barack Obama as he delivered the eulogy of one of our friends, colleagues, and brothers, the Reverend Clementa Pinkney. And everybody remembers that, that state eulogy. Bishop Bryant gave the ecclesiastical eulogy 
in the ecclesiastical portion of the service and then we shifted to the state portion the church had to go first uh, and we remember as President Obama uh, narrated and was weaving this theme of grace through the whole narrative uh, and, and, and we remember when he got to the end, uh, we wouldn't probably uh, categorize him as a singing preacher, but he started singing the song, Amazing Grace. And as I looked over at John Boehner, who I was sitting about 200 feet from, even John Boehner had a little tear in his eye and they had to clap their hands. Uh, there's something about leaders in times of crisis. Uh, doing what they do best that inspires confidence. But I'm here to report on today, Code Black, there is a shepherd down in Charisma Magazine. Uh, we saw this story re reported several years ago about Pastor Isaac Hunter, who took, reportedly took his own life. Uh, Pastor Joel Hunter's influence on the White House, his marriage troubles, an undated suicide note was found but his death is far from the only pastoral suicide. Uh, a few years ago, another pastor who was grieving his dead wife reportedly shot himself in front of his mother and son, expressing that he was hearing his dead spouse's voice and footsteps. This pastor, Ed Montgomery, and his late wife, Prophetess Jackie Montgomery, served at the Full Gospel Assemblies International Church in Hazelcrest, Illinois. In November 2013, a Georgia pastor killed himself in between services. Laurent, uh, Laurenisha Sims Parker, wife of the Reverend Teddy Parker, found the pastor in the driveway of their home with a self-inflicted gunshot. Houston County Coroner da da Danny Galpin reports. And so we ask the question why the sudden rash of pastors committing suicide suicide is not a new problem among clergy but there are known suicide that there are three that occurred in just two months of each other just a couple of years ago and it begs us to deeper look at the question of leadership not only in the world but particularly in the kingdom of God now there is no lack of statistics about pastors and depression burnout health low pay, spirituality, relationships, and longevity, and none of the statistics are good. You want to hear some of this this morning? According to the Schaefer Institute, 70% of pastors constantly fight depression. 71% are burned out. 72% of pastors say that they only study the Bible when they are preparing for sermons. 80% believe pastoral ministry has negatively affected their families. And 70% say that they don't have a close friend. I didn't see any candidates for pastoral ministry. None of you raised your hands. The Schaefer Institute also reports that 80% of seminary and Bible school graduates will leave the ministry within five years. Now, it's not clear how many commit suicide, but it is clear that pastors are not immune to it. Psychologists point to several reasons why people commit suicide, from depression to psychosis to stressful life situations. But one thing is certain, whatever drives someone to take their own life ultimately begins in the mind. Suicide. Suicidal thoughts precede suicidal actions. Along the lines of depressed preachers, one that stands out in my mind is particularly the prophet who, uh, Elijah, who after preaching one of his greatest sermons on Mount Carmel, slaying the prophets of Baal and the, and the prophets of Ashtoreth, then hears a word that Jezebel is going to take his life. He runs 40 miles away and says to the Lord, I want to die. But the angel comes, the ravens come and bring him some food and bread. He rises and goes 400 miles to the same mountain that Moses was buried in, saying that he wants to die. But I'm so glad he got in the cave. And there wasn't fire, there wasn't rock, there wasn't earthquake, but in a still small voice. As Elijah heard God uh, renew him and revive him, refresh him, and retask him for the assignment. Here we are in the text on the night that Jesus was betrayed, the same night that he took bread, the same night he gave thanks. 
The same night after supper, he took the cup, and when he gave thanks, he gave it and said, Drink it. Oh, this is my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of your sins. Do this as often as you shall do it. Do it in remembrance of me here on this first Sunday when we celebrate his death, passion, and resurrection. But in the middle of this narrative, there are these two verses that haunt all of us, particularly those of us who are called to the gospel ministry and pastoral leadership. Here the text says, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. A couple of realities that jump out to me at the text. Can I share with you just a few of them? Number one, shepherds are servants. Shepherds are called to serve the Lord by serving God's people. Our first call is to study, and after we study, we serve. It's a blessing, and it's such a blessing to be called. As I was talking with one pastor this week, he said he was reminded of something that one of his mentors said. We get to do this. Y'all heard me in the prayer this morning uh, with the stewardesses and also with the ministers. God, we thank you because we get to do this. We don't deserve it, but you call us to service, and we thankful for, for that service. Jeremiah 315, God, Jeremiah speaks to the nation of Israel and says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart. They are gifts that will help you get down the road. Now I got some news for you. This is a yoke. This is not a temp job. Hmm. This is a calling. It's not a profession. Yeah, it's not you can just change careers when you feel like it. It's a calling that will trouble you in the midnight hour when you're up at 2 o'clock praying for folks who are sitting home eating collard greens and chicken and they don't bit more care about their problem. This is a life. It is not a career. We came in and uh, got the Uber the other night, finally got to our hotel. Our driver was from Nigeria. His name was Shole. He said he'll come worship with us one Sunday. He already has a church home. And I began to tell him, I said, well, we're moving here. And the new pastor, he said, to do this thing, you have to give up your life, don't you? He said, you're moving here to this area because you don't belong to yourself. My wife and I were sitting in the car, it was about almost 12 midnight or later than that, and we're hearing this man talk, you're doing this because you don't belong to yourself. He said, I need you to pray for me because I have not yet said yes to the Lord. I said, come on in, the water's fine. I, there, there, there's going to be some difficult times. There are going to be some tears shed. There are going to be some struggles and pains. But if God is calling you, God is faithful. But here's the challenge of shepherding and being a servant. You have to give account for not only for your own soul, but also for the souls that God has entrusted to your care. So unlike sheep who when you stand before the Lord, you have only yourself to give account for. When shepherds stand before the Lord, they have to give account for everything every soul that has been entrusted into their care and that's why Paul writes to Timothy and says now tell the saints let it be joyful don't let it be grievous for them to watch over you because they must give account for your soul separates are the Lord's servants the second thing I see in the text as you see it as Jesus is talking he said you smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter uh, there are swords against the shepherds the other reference text that makes Jesus call this out comes from the book of Zechariah. It's over in Zechariah. Let me tell you, Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 13, verses 7 through 9 is what Jesus is quoting as he's on his way to a very difficult death. And Zechariah talks about the sword that was going to come against the shepherds. You see, there are, there are swords that come against the shepherds. You have to understand that when you say go, from the word go, you have to realize that not only is God with you, but the devil is against you. I wish I had somebody up in here. <laughs> now, that's not just true for shepherds. Have you ever made up in your mind that you're going to do what God called you to do? That you're going to be what God called you to be? And you're going to go where God called you to go? And as soon as you took your first step, it seemed like all hell broke loose. Because you decided to do the right thing. Baby, that's not the time to get discouraged and turn around. That's the time to let you know I must be on the right track. Uh, I must have really stumbled into something good. Uh, I must really understand that 
from the time God told me to do whatever he told me to do. There will be some resistance, but there is something that overcomes the resistance. It's called the anointing. Somebody say the anointing. Uh, the anointing is the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and you know something? It's dangerous to be anointed. Hmm. Just ask David who had to run for his life for 10 years. Why? Because a prophet named Samuel took a horn of oil and poured it on his head and anointed him in the name of the Lord. And for 10 years he had to run for his life. It's dangerous when you're anointed. You are marked by God. That's why you got so much hell coming up into your job. Because when you walk in on Monday, it's because of the anointing. People don't understand what God is doing in your life. You're anointed. <sighs> It's dangerous to be anointed. It's like turning on the light. And when you turn on the light, it attracts moths, it attracts flies. Hello, somebody. You know, some sisters, I don't know why these men are always talking to me. Baby, your light is on. That's why they, <laughs> they, they want a good, you know, they go to the club on Saturday night when they want that kind of woman. But the women they want to go home with is in church on Sunday morning. I don't know. I don't. That that wasn't on my paper. I don't know what happened. I'm, I was maybe I was helping somebody just then. It's dangerous to be anointed. But watch this. It's even more dangerous when you understand what you're anointed for. <laughs> when you understand what you are anointed for. You can go and do what you're anointed for. Oh, you, just, you didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. When you understand what you're anointed for, you'll be like Elijah dealing with, Alyssa dealing with Naaman the Syrian who called him. And the, and, and the king sent a letter to the king and said, I want you to heal my servant Naaman of leprosy. The king got the letter, tore his clothes, couldn't read the letter. Elijah said, send me the mail. That's not for you. That's mail. That, that mail is supposed to come to the prophet, not to the king. Send me that letter and then he read the letter and said send this message back to the king of Syria tell him to send Naaman to me can I deal with stuff like that I'm anointed to deal with stuff like that and when you know what you're anointed for you don't take anything for off the devil when you know that you are anointed to drive him out of people's homes to drive him out of people's finances to drive them out of people's marriages you can do that in Jesus name in the name of Jesus we speak here in your house we speak deliverance in your house we speak blessings on your marriage when you know what you are anointed for yeah. 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 when you know what you're anointed for you don't have to back down when the devil starts roaring because Jesus pulled all his teeth out at Calvary. He's just a roar, a lion with a roar. He's a dog barking, but he ain't got no teeth in his head because you have the anointing. Yeah, yeah. Mm. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. Yeah. I like that old song that said, Jesus said, if you go, I'll go with you. <laughs> Open your mouth, I'll speak for you. <laughs> and, and what, Lord, if I go, tell me what to say. They won't believe in me. Shepherds feed and lead, even while swords are brandished against them. You see, because the vision is in the head and it's relayed through the eyes. Shepherd, what do you see? What do you hear? And, and when you understand leadership, you understand there is not division. That's two visions. That's division. There's only one vision. And one who has supervision. Vision over and above all of the vision that happens in the house of God. And so watch this. Because it's a dangerous to be anointed. Do you know who the first apostolic martyr was? James. We shared it the other night in Bible study. Well, if Herod was going to interrupt the flow of the church, he knew who to go after. Uh, Peter's a great preacher, wonderful preacher, turns folks home. It's good, but I'm not going after Peter. John is the apostle. He just, can't we all just get along? Just want to love somebody. 
when the first apostle was executed, it was James because James was the visionary leadership behind the growth of the church in Jerusalem. In just a short time, they had gone from 3,000 members on the first day to 8,000 members within the first 30 days. 8,000 members in 30 days, and it took a James to organize prayer from house to house. He organized the class leaders. He organized the stewards. He organized the prayer meeting. And so when Herod sought to persecute the church, he said, let me take out your head and your eyes. So you can't see their swords against shepherds. And then finally, you see in the text, number three, there are sheep who missed the way. Uh, smite the shepherd, and what's going to happen? Uh, out of 12 disciples, watch these leadership numbers. 12 disciples. Only three out of every 12 will perceive your vision. Some of you are doing a friend check right now. Some of y'all going to go to your Facebook page, scroll, select, delete. Because you got some folks around you who are trying to kill your vision for life. Three out of every 12, only three out of every 12 will embrace your vision. Only one will be able to articulate it. Only one will love you for it. And then the other is going to help organize it. But watch this. One out of every 12 is going to betray you. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> and didn't Jesus say on that night, Reverend Parson, he said, have I not chosen 12 and one of you is a devil? So some of you are going to your Facebook page now and you're going to count down friends. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, 12. I'm going to get rid of you. <laughs> but there's only one out of 12 that will stick with you. And that's the John that hangs with you all night long, no matter what you're going through. There are, is a friend who will stick closer than a brother. I'm here to tell you we are in a leadership crisis. We're seeing it at global levels. We're seeing it at national levels. And saints, I don't have to tell you, you need to take care of business on that Tuesday in November, because if we don't, we're going to be in a worse mess than we have ever been in before. We are in a leadership crisis. We get the wrong shepherd on Pennsylvania Avenue. I told, I told, I think I told, I don't know if the trustees are still one of these meetings. I told them, I said, on Wednesday after the election, I'm writing a letter to President-elect Hillary Clinton uh, to invite her to come worship at Union Bethel Brandywine when she gets into Washington. Amen. <laughs> okay. Some of y'all going to get that when you get home. I, I just, in the words of Forrest Gump, that's about all I'm going to say about that. Uh, and that's about all I can say about that at this point. Uh, but we're in a leadership crisis, and we can see that more and more. There is a great falling away that's precipitated in the text. It says when you smite shepherds, when you destroy leadership, people scatter. Uh, the, the reverse of that is so true, and Solomon uttered it in Proverbs. He said, without a vision, people perish. Uh, without a visionary, people wander. Without a vision, people perish. And that word perish in the Hebrew translates to die a violent and untimely death. So God places leaders to keep us from dying a violent and untimely death. That's why in the midst of all that is going on, we need prophetic leadership who has not had, does not have Jezebel covering their mouth, crying loud and sparing not, crying when black boys are gunned down to the street, crying loud when our young girls are taken away, crying when disadvantaged uh, are already down, are pressed down even further. We need those to stand up with prophetic boldness and declare truth to power that this is right and this is wrong and show the people their sins, show them at every level. God needs leaders and when God blesses us with leaders, not just the shepherd, but pastors and ministers and class leaders and stewards, 
doers and trustees and missionaries and lay and ushers and deaconesses and choir. When God blesses leadership and leadership stands up, we can ensure that the body of Christ will stand strong. Well, I opened with the story of an Englishman, and I close now with the story of an Englishman, one of England's finest preachers, Charles Harrison Spurgeon lived from 1834 to 1892, frequently during his ministry was plunged into severe depression, due in part to gout, but also for other reasons. On Sunday mornings, this man would preach to 6,000 people at the Metropolitan Tabernacle Baptist Church in London, England, while downstairs in his furnace room, Six or seven hundred people would be in prayer, praying for him while he's preaching upstairs. That was on Sunday. In the chancel area of the church were stenographers. This is in the 1800s who would transcribe his sermons so that by Tuesday morning, what he preached on Sunday morning in London was in newspapers in America. Every Bible program, electronic Bible program you buy has some of Spurgeon's sermons and thoughts in it. One of the greatest preachers that we'd ever seen in the 19th century suffered from depression. There's a cold black, shepherd down. The alert has gone out. There is a leadership crisis. There's a dearth of shepherds is increasing in the land. But there's another shepherd I know about. And um, uh, in our tradition, we say it was a good Friday. But when you look at the scene, it really looks like a black Friday in the worst sense. <laughs> uh, the thing I like about this shepherd is that when he was with his sheep on the night before he was about to die, uh, he told them what was going to happen. But he told Brother Peter, said, now, you're going to deny me, but I've already prayed. I already got you covered. I've already walked with you where you're going, and I know how it's going to come out on the other side. I'm so glad that when they took that shepherd <laughs> and the Roman soldiers whipped him all night long, <laughs> They, they whipped him with a cat of nine tails, which is entwined with leather and metal bits. And when they ripped and lashed, they raked 39 times for the 39 categories of diseases. Uh, 39 times he was last for you and for me by his stripes I'm healed not because he died but, but when they put nails in his hand and they hung him up high and the blood came pouring down he said father it is finished oh but after three days uh, after three days and three nights in the grave, he rose again. And guess what? I'm so glad that he changed the cold black into a cold red. Uh, red is the color of the blood. Uh, and because of the blood that Jesus shed for me, it still reaches from the highest mountain. And it flows, what, to the lowest. That's me, that's me. I don't know about you, but I've been in the valley. And I need the blood to flow. The blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. Stand on your feet in the presence of God today. Will never lose its power. And when he rose... He arose with power in his hand. Cold black became a cold red. Yeah. Cold black shepherd down. Cold red savior arisen. And he's alive. Reigning and ruling for your life. Every head bowed all over this place. Someone here may need to and want to make a decision for Jesus Christ today. It is mine to offer that opportunity to you. And I pray that this is not the last time you will hear the voice of the gospel preached through any of his servants. 
It's an opportunity for you to get to know Jesus for yourself. So I'm inviting you, the first person, I'm inviting you to be in relationship with Jesus. Because he lives, you can face your tomorrow. Yeah, because he lives. I'm so glad he didn't leave the shepherds down. Uh, but he rose as the great shepherd of the sheep and turned our coal black into coal red. Because he lives, your life can change. That's the first person I'm talking to. The second person I'm talking to is you need a church home wonderful church to be a part of not because I'm here not because anybody else is here that makes it wonderful but the reality is that for 129 years God has been moving through the life of this congregation that's a good place to belong here at Union Bethel Brandywine or maybe you live a little bit uh, or toward the other direction go ahead and west toward Temple Hills you can come on be with us north and west there if that's you, I invite you to come and unite in fellowship. I'd love to be your pastor. I'd love to help you to know the will, will, way, and word of the Lord. And then the third group I'm talking to, those who are seekers. If you just came by here today and you said, you know, I don't know about the first question. Maybe I'm not ready for that. That's okay. That's fine. Um, Reverend, I'm, you know, still looking for a church home. That's cool, too. I invite you to come into the showroom and kick the tires as often as you want. You can kick the tires. You can open and close the doors. You can see how this works for you. I'd rather have you check it out. And so if you're here, I invite you to come. I invite you to come. Hard to climb. I what? Oh, I started out. Troy Wheeler is coming to join the church today. Come on, give God thanks and praise. Amen. You need to be saved or you need a church home or you're a seeker and you stop by here today and you need some prayer. Oh, somebody else needs to come. Oh, is it rough and the going gets tough? Going gets tough. And the hills are, the hills are hard to climb. I started out a long time ago, a long time ago. There is no doubt, there is no doubt in my mind. I, I decided to make Jesus. Brother Troy, here's what I want. You, uh, here's what I want to do. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Use my words, but let it come from your heart. I want you to remember this because you're going to hear this in new members training. Salvation is as easy as A, B, C. A, we admit. What are we admitting? That we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, Brother Troy, I want you to be certain. That's everybody. That's not y'all have sinned. It's we all have sinned. All right. We're all tore up from the floor up. That's why we come. Amen. We admit that we sin and come short of this glory. But we believe in our hearts that God sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins and that he was raised to flip the switch and turn that cold black into a cold red. And now through the precious blood, we can be healed, saved, and receive eternal life and abundant life. And then see, we confess. What are we confessing? Simply that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. And the Bible says in Romans, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. And it's just that simple. That's why we call it the ABCs of salvation. You got it? You're going to hear it again, but I want to share it with you. Now I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Use my words, but let it come from your heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you. Come on, I thank you that you have died for me. I admit that I've sinned. I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Renew me in your presence. I believe in my heart that you are the Savior of the world. 
and that you rose again so I could rise to new life in this world and eternal life with you. I confess you are my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Heal me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can have the power to live for you in Jesus name now my father my God I pray that you look upon Troy touch him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet we pray for total healing health hopeless deliverance and strength as he is walking in faith to you and finding a church home God we pray that you, and thank you that you have led him to this place and we pray now in the name of Jesus through the power of your shed blood that you will work your work in him build him up and raise him up to be a strong soldier for you in this household of faith and we thank you for it in jesus name somebody tell the lord thank you amen new members ministry come on amen amen Heels are hard to glide i started out long time ago I'm going to ask Brother Rodney, I'm going to ask that you go with Reverend Ray and let's welcome Brother Troy in. Come on, give God some praise for those who are joining the church. Oh, oh, oh you know the road is rough and the going is tough. standing for the tithe litany. I tithe because it is a direct command from God. I tithe because it is holy unto God. I tithe because God commands his people to do so. I tithe because it is evident of consecration. I tithe because tithing makes me conscious of my partnership with God. I tithe because after getting nine tenths for myself, I should not, I should not then use any part of it or all of God's one tenth. I tithe because God promises a cure, a curse upon all who rob him by refusing to tithe. I tithe because I believe in prayer and I stand in need of God's help every day for which I must pray. I tithe because I need and want the blessing which God promises those who tithe. I tithe because the tithe is a debt which every man owes God. It should be paid. Amen. Take that gift and hold it up in the Lord's presence today. Let me thank the congregation last month for the new season seed you sowed eighteen thousand ninety eight dollars amen we're on our way and you see the report in your worship guide it's also in your 
uh, newsletter as well. And if you're doing that, you just mark on the offering, New Season C. Thank you so much. And we're on our way, and you're about to start seeing a few things start happening around here. Amen. God, we thank you for the seed and the sower, the gift and the giver. Bless both in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The ushers will direct you. The stewards will receive your gifts. The merchant terminals are in the back left corners, and I have been informed uh, that the books will be available after service in the um, conference room. So you'll be able, those of you pre-order, be able to come, and those of you who want to buy, you'll be able to come. get.